Yeah, welcome to the class. We've got um, international master Brandon Clark here. He's going to be improving our positional chess because we feel that most juniors struggle with positional play. They're very good at attacking um, and getting checkmates. But in order to get better at chess, you need to be um, good at positional chess as well. So this is the second session uh, for today on positional chess. And we hope you learn a lot of things from it. We're going to send you out a study with all the positions in after the class. So you can go back through the material and anything that you don't, we don't get a chance to cover today, um, you can also do in your own time. You set them up for the studies. Um, so um, yeah, over to Brandon, who's gonna get started. All right, excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's good to see a lot of you again. For those that are new, welcome to, uh, to the class. Hope you're going to enjoy it and learn a lot. I was getting this chat window up on the other screen so I can see your guys' answers. All right, so let me share my screen then. And we can get get started. Yeah, please communicate in the chat. And um, you're all um, muted, yeah. but just ask any questions in the chat, and um, we'll be here to help you. Um, okay. Do you need to let people in from the waiting room? Oh uh, yeah, we'll do that now. Sorry. Okay. Slacking. I oh, know I am. They're all, they're all there actually. Just waiting. Okay. Perfect. All right. So yeah. So the topic for today's session is all about um, pawn play, and that might sound a bit basic to start with, but actually it's a very um, important um, topic because uh, it's something that I think a lot of junior players kind of neglect to think, oh, you know, how valuable can pawns really be? They're only worth one point. And so there's kind of this emphasis where they, they're more interested in, you know, doing their tactics and things like that um, in order to improve. But actually you can learn a lot from understanding uh, the roles of pawns in the game. And uh, one famous guy, Philidor, once said that Pawns are the souls of chess. So very important to uh, give them at least some credit, right? So we've got lots of things to get through today. So it should be quite an enjoyable session. Uh, you know, we're just going to start off with some pawn values, uh, flank free central pawns, outside pass pawns, uh, some pawn chains, some levers. We've got isolated pawns. We've got double pawns. We've got breakthroughs, minority attacks, king walks. It's going to be pretty, pretty packed session. And by the end of it, you're all going to be like Russian super grandmasters, hopefully. <laughs> We'll see. Fingers crossed. Okay, so let's begin. So the first thing I wanted to kind of introduce to you guys was this idea of what exactly are the pawn values? And you guys are probably thinking, what? Is, is there actually a pawn values? Because like, surely it is worth one point. Yeah, technically one point, but actually we can go into, we could be a little bit more specific. And so what I did is I, um, again, made some very colorful uh, diagram. And if you guys were doing the last session, you'll realize that's uh, you know, a thing I tend, I tend to do. And what I was trying to illustrate here is kind of the different type of value that each pawn uh, actually has. And so let's imagine for, to start off with that we've got kind of the opening or the middle game stage um, initially, right? Now, in the opening middle game stage, we can say that the central pawns are the most valuable, right, of all, of all the pawns, which is why you're always taught to uh, move your central pawns first and try to control the central squares, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, but it's important to understand that actually these guys on the sides aren't supposed to be as high valued, right? And so um, I actually did a thing here, if I can make my screen a bit bigger. You can see I've gave kind of a rough value to each of uh, the pawns. So central ones I gave as their full one point, the bishop pawns I gave as a 0 0.9, the knights 0 0.8 and the rooks 0 0.7 which is why if you were to exchange a central pawn for something like a knight or a bishop pawn, usually it's not so not supposed to be so good for you, right? Which is also why you want to try capture towards the center. So if I bring up a just position to kind of illustrate that, uh, let's do empty position like this. Okay, and let's get position from a, a Sicilian where black does this. White goes here, and now let's say white decides to take. Now we kind of understand the pawn values a little bit better. It's easy to see that if this guy's already worth the whole one point, taking this way would kind of decrease its value slightly, right? Not that much, but, but you know, <laughs> we always want to be greedy, want to make sure everything's a high value. And so if this guy's only a 0 0.8, if we have an opportunity to take to become a bishop pawn, we're capturing towards the center, and that way our value goes up slightly, yeah? So that kind of helps you to kind of to judge whether you should capture with a B pawn or with the or with the D pawn, right? So capture towards the center and your pawn increases in value as a result. Okay, so let's go back. 
So that's just how the pawn values are in the opening and middle game stages. Now, in the end game, it's important to understand that now everything is reversed. So notice that here I've kind of put green as being the best, blue is like second best, yellow is like next best, and red's like the worst, right? And then over here, all of a sudden the central pawns have become red. Okay, how's that happened? The royal pawns are not so royal anymore. They're not so, uh, you know, favorable. And all of a sudden the rook pawns are, you know, they're getting all the glory. They've become a full, a full one point. And so we have to understand then why is that the case? Why is that, why is that the, the case in the end game? And so we shall see that with our next uh, diagram here, where white, we have equal material, first of all, right? Both sides have four pawns each. But white is actually better here because he has um, a majority of pawns on the flank on the side of the board. So he's got two against one on this side. He's also got two against one on that side. So this is what we would call a majority. Right? He's got one more pawn on that side of the board. And that allows him to have an advantage here. So first question of the day, why do you think white has the advantage? Because black has sent two very nice central pawns, yeah? So what, why do you think white would have the advantage here? Very important to understand. So you can type that in the chat. Yeah, try, try to message privately. you privately. Yep, fantastic. Otherwise, everyone will see your answers. You don't necessarily want that. We're all quite competitive. Do it to Brandon or to me or to both if you want to. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Katie's got it. Fantastic. William seems to be on the right, the right track. Yeah. Okay, so I want to know why. Yeah, so why has pawns on the side? That's true, but I want to know like why why is that a good thing? Why are they why are the uh, the flank pawns better than the central pawns? Well, because they can be promoted. <laughs> <laughs> Really oh, the central pawns can also be promoted. Right? <laughs> it's a two on one. Yeah, it's a two on one. But like you could argue that the black's got a two on zero, right? These are these are already pass pawns. So you'd think that these guys ought to be stronger, right? Um, okay, Florian seems to be kind of on the right the right track. Yes. Okay, so we're kind of getting there. Looks like. Yeah, everyone have a go. Ah, uh, that's nice. Yeah, Katie made a nice, uh, a nice point actually. She she mentioned that black has three pawn islands, and white only has two. So for those of you that don't know what a pawn island is, it's basically um, where pawns is like on its own, right? It's got no one else nearby. So these guys, this he'd be classed as one island. These guys would be the second one, and this guy would be a third pawn island. And white has one here, and a second one over there, right? So white has two pawn islands. Black has three. And usually the fewer pawn lines you have, the better. So that's a nice um, yeah, point that Katie made there. Okay, so let's have a look then why why this uh, white why white is better. And it's all to do with actually the king. So a lot of you mentioned that the white king can kind of control the two black pawns, which is great. Um, so these guys actually aren't that scary. And the problem for the black is that although we don't yet have a pass pawn, because remember a pass pawn is something that can run up the board and no other pawn can uh, prevent you from doing so, right? Now, a pass pawn is such a, a valuable thing in the end game because it forces the king to go and deal with that pawn, right? If you have a pawn like this, you just like launch Barry up the board, off he goes, go, off you go Barry, good luck. He just gets taken and the king didn't need to help. And so that's really useful, right? If you had imagined this, these guys were off the board, and Gary went up the board and Barry went up the board, then the king would have to try to deal with both. And it's a bit of a disaster, right? He's too slow. He can't, uh, he can't deal with both of those. So that's why pass pawns are such a dangerous uh, thing to have. Um, so the first thing that white needs to do then is he needs to kind of create a pass pawn. This is the whole point of having a majority. Whenever you have a majority, you have this kind of uh, two on one or three on two situation. You have this extra pawn and you need to make sure that you create a pass pawn at all costs, okay? Now, first question of the day, let's focus on the queen side to start with. And we have a choice of which pawn to move. We've got Ari, we've got Barry, we can go one, we can go two, we can go one or two on the other side. There's a lot of choices, got 25% chance of getting it right. Um, I'm gonna whip out my timer here. Okay, so white to play, which of these moves do you think is the best one to start with? Very, very important to get the right, the right move. So have a think about it. 
type in the chat. Yeah, type it back. says, whoops. I forgot my screen is all the way over there. Hopefully it did. Some of them weren't noticing. Some, some typed the wrong ones. That's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why did I say Ari and Barry? Well, they have to have names, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got to give them names. I can't just call them the A porn and the B porn. That's too boring. <laughs> We could we call we could we could call the people on Brandon, but then I might get sacrificed. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be involved. To be honest. Um, okay, the B porn is pretty popular. That's good. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. You know, show me some love and push me up the board. <laughs> as long as you're not planning on sacrificing me, I won't be very I won't be very happy if you do that. Brandon. The S porn. Barry to become a queen. S. Where's the S porn? I think they're trying to get you involved, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, the S one just like takes. And... Yeah, she's got to play like uh, what's that other game called? Four player chess or something. Where... Uh, <laughs> just sit there and enjoy becoming a queen and the S porn. Yeah. yeah. Very proud of that. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. All right. So we've got basically the A and the B. So, okay. So <laughs> we have to, we, we got to look at both basically. Uh, but yeah, you guys aren't sure. It's not, it's not easy. Um, so as a general rule, whenever you're trying to work out which pawn you should push, uh, push first with a majority, you should always push the one that has nothing opposite it, okay? And the reason we want to do that is to make sure that our majority doesn't become fixed. So for example, if we first start with, uh, with the A pawn, then black can go A5 and all of a sudden, our two pawns are stuck. Disaster, right? Because that means our one, the one pawn controls our two pawns and therefore our advantage on that side is is no longer relevant, right? Because if we try to now push through, yes, we can do this. They take, we go over here. If we both try to push like this, well, they kind of queen at the same time. So that's not particularly very helpful. And we don't really want to have to bring our king over either to try help because he's busy dealing with, with Edward. And, uh, you know, he's a bit of a bit of a problem. So let's go back. So that, that's that's why we always want to push the one that is not opposed first. So we start with, uh, with Barry. And that way, this pawn can never stop us from from using our majority, we can guarantee we're going to create a pass pawn. Because if he goes like this, a6, we can go a4, and that way we're still kind of trying to break through. So let's say the king comes over, trying to help out. Now we can go on the other side. Okay, so let's see if you guys can get it right again. So which pawn should we start with? Gary or Harry? Give you a quick timer. I'm only give, I'm only give you 30 seconds though, because you know it should be should be easy now, right? Should we all get it right? For 100 percent if you understood yeah, I want hundred percent. Not the B pawn, Gary or Harry, which one? One or two squares, but hopefully you'll realize that we need Gary, to Gary, Gary's popular. My time is gone. There it is. All right. Eight seconds. Make sure you type an answer. No, gone Lalo, not not the Harry. <laughs> Gary. All right. Okay, that's the uh, yes, fantastic. Okay, so yeah. Um, definitely want to go with Gary because again, if we go with Harry, then they go H5 and all of a sudden our pawns get stuck again. Not good, right? So we start off with Gary since he's the one that's not got anyone in his way. And after that, we can start to try to create pass pawn on this other side as well. Okay. So something like this would happen. And now we can see that two pass pawns have been created. And hopefully this helps to illustrate exactly why the flank pawns are superior to the central pawns in the end game, right? Which is why in this situation here, I highlighted that the, the green ones, the best pawns would be the ones on the side, okay? So one more position I want to give you then, just to make sure you guys are all understanding this correctly. Let's put pawns like this, a pawn here. Let's put a king somewhere and a white king here, and let's put, give black with his one more pawn, like this. And we need pawns on both sides, like this, and like this. And knight can be hiding over there. And we have a bishop lurking somewhere. Let's like this, and put him back a little bit. Okay, so some, something like this. And let's just imagine that black has just captured one of our pawns on g3. So we have a choice. We could take of Harry or with Freddy. So which one do you think is the correct solution? Have a think. Gonna be mean, gonna start the time off for 30 seconds. Because we've got we've got a lot to get through, you know. It's a 50-50 decision, can't be that hard. Lots of Freddy's on Harry. A lot of Freddy. Freddy's popular. 
You make me hungry, actually. It reminded me of that, uh, that, that Fredo thing, the little chocolate bar. <laughs> yeah, the Fredo as well. <laughs> a little Fredo, Fredo uh, chocolate thing. All right, we've got a bit, lot, mostly, it's about 75% Freddy at the moment. Harry's getting a little bit of love, but not too much for Harry. Okay, so let's have a look then. So, yeah, because we're in the end game stage, guys, it's very important we capture towards the side, actually. So we take with Freddy, and that way we're capturing uh, towards the flank, and then that way we can try to create an outside past form, which is going to be very uh, valuable. We'll see that again in just a second. Um, remember, though, if this is the opening or middle game stage, so let's say there's like a lot more pieces on the board, then you'd actually want to capture towards the center. So then you would actually take with Harry instead, right? So opening middle game, we take towards the uh, center. And in the end game, we take towards the, the flanks, towards the side. Yeah. Make sense? And you'll just ask because you took with Freddie and then you're saying, but Gary could move forward. So after F takes two, three, G four. I mean, that is true. But I think Brandon was just talking about the structure and then why would probably go King F two and bring the King round. Um, yeah, te technically you could do that. Yeah, regardless. Uh, maybe I should have put the pawn further back just to be a little bit. But, you know, guys, I've got to, I got to make a random position off the top of my head. It was always prepared. Mm -hmm. You've got to uh, give me some, some <laughs> leeway. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to this. And now we're looking at a flank on one side. Okay, so now the issue is um, we're only dealing with pawns on one side of the board. And so this is, again, very important to understand because um, when we have pawns on both sides of the board, so pawns on the queen side and pawns on the king side, we have that, the, the, the rook pawns have a lot of value because of this um, example, right, where they can create uh, pawn outside uh, past pawns on both sides, right, which really spreads the king to try and defend against both, okay? So this is an example where the, those rook pawns are really valuable. Now, if we go to the this example, because there's only pawns on one side of the board, there's no guys on the, uh, the queen side here, these guys actually aren't that powerful. We're going to see why that is in a second as well. So black to play, you're down two pawns, but you have a chance to save yourselves. William, in case so, you read it right, but they, um, we did this in one of the sessions, so well done for listening and understanding. It's you did this puzzle? It's a famous position, it's great. No, it's really good, but not so, everyone has seen it before. Um, I, I guess the theme is the same. Yeah, I kind of like put the pieces on random squares, <laughs> but I didn't know it was like... Oh, yeah, I think there's a famous game where the rooks get exchanged on the C file and then it gets to the same game. Ah, I see. Oh, and apparently it's in the Jeremy Silman Endgame book, which is probably... Is it? Oh, fun. there you go. So Silman's stealing my, my things. Mm -hmm. It's still a very hard question. To okay, so it looks like everyone's, everyone's got the right idea. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so basically bishop h3 is a really nice idea, shows great endgame understanding to sacrifice your bishop for the g-pawn, because he's the only one that can help white to win his position. If um, this guy gets exchanged, which is going to be forced now because he's pinned to the king, um, and if he takes it doesn't really change anything, this configuration of pieces, despite being up a lot of material, is not able to uh, force my king out of the corner because you have the wrong color bishop. If this bishop was a dark square bishop, then you could uh, you could win this, but otherwise it's just a draw. So this is the whole point I included this, was just to kind of showcase that uh, if you have pawns only one side of the board, then the rook pawns become useless kind of once again. So they have this kind of small window of opportunity. It's only a small window of glory, where in the end game, pawns on both sides, they, can, uh, they have that glory, but um, it quickly disappears as well. Two Harrys and they're still not doing a good job. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So this is an example where, again, they have that, that their, their glory because there's pawns on both sides of the board here. Well, at least from the white perspective, that's kind of all we care about. And so, again, we can see that this rook pawn would be worth more than central pawn and white can just use it as a decoy. Yep, so okay, he's got the right idea. Let's go a4, now to king b4, king d4 takes and king d takes d5. And the issue is the white king is a lot more active than the black king. And so we can take his pawns faster than he can, he can take ours, basically. Okay, fantastic. So we've got already now good concept of the value of the pawns, both in the opening and uh, middle game, and now also the end game. So that's very important to understand. And now let's move on to a different uh, topic. So we're going to go on to these kind of pawn chains. I decided to take a position from the uh, French defense for, for this example. So whenever we're dealing with the pawn chain, what do you think we should be doing? Should we attack the pawn chain from the, at the head with F6, or should we attack with C5 at the base? 
head or the base? Give you a few seconds to type in an answer. Everyone seems to know, fantastic. The brace. Close enough. All right, fantastic. Yeah, so we want to attack definitely the base. And the, I think the good way to kind of understand why that is, is like, imagine if you had to, uh, you know, your parents told you to go out on a Saturday afternoon, you got to go do some weeding and you got to pull that weed out of the ground. And if you just like kind of gave it a little tickle on the top, it's just going to grow back. And then like, you know, a few weeks later, you got to go back out there and you got to do the same thing. So we really got to do is you got to get your spade, you got to get into the earth, you got to get rip it up. Um, and get rid of that thing from the base and then it's just it's gone right once it's gone you don't have to do any more weeding hopefully right so it's the same with the pawn chains if we just go like f6 maybe he goes f4 and we take he can just replace it not particularly uh desirable for us um but if we go c5 okay technically again you can reinforce it like this so it's like this is what a pawn chain is but again if we could try and attack the base and so now the base has become b2 um we get rid of this guy then these ones will slowly kind of fall like um, like a bunch of dominoes or something afterwards, right? So that's the correct solution. So C5 is a very, very important move. You'll be surprised how many people would go like knight C6 in this position. This is a terrible move because you don't put any pressure on the center. This knight looks like it puts some pressure, but white can defend easily. And now you have a massive uh, space disadvantage because it's pawns in your half of the board and it's very hard to kind of, um, yeah, find good squares for these for these guys. They're all getting stuck. So you need to be playing c5. You've got to use these pawn breaks, and that way, um, black black's strategy will just be to develop like this. Queen goes to b6 often and puts pressure on these pawns, um, which gives him kind of counterplay despite having a lack of space. Okay, next example. So we now know that with pawn chains, we should always be trying to attack them at the base, which is very important. And now we're going to look at a new uh, concept where we're still kind of looking at the pawn chain and we're trying to work out um, some attacking details. So the pawn chain can actually tell you a lot about your position. It can tell you whether, um, you know, whether you should be attacking on the queen side or the king side. So let's look at this position from Black's perspective. Do you think Black should attack on the queen side or should be attacking on the king side? I'll give you, uh, I don't know, 20 seconds. It's already there, so might as well. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want any moves necessarily. I just want to know king side or queen side. Just Maybe sure. K or Q is the deal. You can't be bothered to type it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we've got, it's pretty 50 50 actually. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's good then. So it shows that you guys aren't quite sure, which is fine. Um, that means we can yeah pick up some some knowledge here. Okay, so yeah, the pawn chain is very important to pay attention to in any given position because it can sometimes give you hints on what your plan should be. And remember, to be a good chess player, it's always good to have some sort of plan in mind. If you play without a plan, um, then you're you're probably uh, not going to be too successful, right? So you need to always have some sort of plan in mind. Uh, remember that a bad plan is usually better than, than no plan at all. So here we can see that our pawns are pointing actually in the direction of the, the queen side of the board, right? And so what that's telling us is that we should be then trying to attack on that side of the board, right? Because that's where we're going to be stronger. So therefore, once we know that, um, we, we can kind of see that. It's easy then to see that black should go like a6, a3, a rook b8, and then try to play for like b5 and attack on that side of the board, okay? Now remember, when I do this little arrow thing and I'm pointing to the B4 square or the A3 square, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to that square. I'm trying to attack that square. It just means that side of the board, okay? Very important to understand that too. Okay, so that's good. Let's see if you guys can do the next one then. So again, we're looking at this from the black perspective, another position taken from the King's Indian. And white has just gone knight back to, uh, to E1. So you can make a nice pawn chain like this. So again, do you think we should be attacking on the king side or the queen side? Wow, you guys are so fast. You're like answering my question before you even said it. <laughs> Looks like everyone has got it. Fantastic. 
Yep, so black wants to attack on the king side in this example, because again, here's our pawn chain. It's pointing kind of in that direction. And so therefore we want to be playing moves like f5, f4, g5, h5, g4, and trying to do like a pawn storm on that king side. And for white, he's gonna have his pawn on f3. His pawn chain is pointing towards the queen side. And so therefore he wants to go like b4, c5, and try to do the same on the other side of the board. Okay, so once you kind of factor in those things, it's much easier to kind of find the right solution here for black. You need to move that knight out the way so that you can uh, go f5, something like this would happen, f3, f4, bishop f2, g5, and then black's going to really try and concentrate all his efforts to making sure he can get a very dangerous attack on the king side where he's stronger. Fantastic. Okay, so that's all we need to know for the pawn chains. Now we're going to go on to kind of the backward pawn and uh, pawn levers, which are also known as like uh, hooks as well. All right, so this is a position I took from the Sveshnikov, which is another um, pretty famous opening. It's been used a lot by Magnus Carlsen, uh, the world champion in recent years. Um, and we can see here that we have a backward pawn and we have a lever as well, a hook. Okay, so can you guys work out? I've highlighted two, two of their pawns, right, these two guys. So which one is the backward pawn and which one would be the, the hook? So just tell me which one's which basically. So the d6 pawn, is that the hook or is that the, is that the backward pawn? And for b5, which one would that be? Uh, yep, looks like everyone's got it, fantastic. Yeah, great. So everyone's looks like they're on the, uh, yeah, everyone's saying the same thing, which is good to see. So yeah, d6 is the backward pawn because he has no other pawns that can like defend him, right? So he's a backward pawn. Now, the two things we need to understand about the backward pawn. The first thing, we always want to attack backward pawns with the heavy pieces, right? The reason we do that is because we always stay um, lined up on them. If we attack with the minor piece, uh, then they might be able to just run away from the from the attack. Um, so let's say I give it just like a real quick position. Let's say there's a backward pawn like like this, and we've got a rook here and a knight like like that. Um, the computer's probably going to hate me for doing this position. He's like, where are the kings, and why is why I've got so many pieces? But okay, we've got a position like this, and if we attack with the knight, the pawn can just move away, right? And then the knight's no longer attacking. But if we attack with a heavy piece then the pawn moves, we can still be attacking, right? So that's kind of why you'd always want to attack a backward pawn with your heavy pieces. So that's the first we have to understand. Let's delete this chapter, otherwise it's not going to be very useful for the later notes. Um, okay, so that's the first rule. The second rule, let's say you can't win that pawn. Uh, maybe they've got like their bishop comes back here and they're defending the pawn uh, enough times that your, your heavy pieces can't just crash through and win it. Then the second rule would be to use the, the square in front of a backward pawn as an outpost for, for your knight. Okay, so that's exactly what White has done in this position. He realizes he's not, not going to be able to win that d6 pawn easily. And so instead he settles for creating, um, using that, uh, that square for his knight on that uh, nice central outpost. Okay, so b5 would be the, the hook. And hooks are really... Um, kind of considered a weakness because it allows us to use one of our pawns to kind of latch onto it and it helps us to kind of rip open the position, which is a big problem for them. Um, and so here we can see we can go a4 actually, attacking this pawn, and this forces black basically to, to take, and that allows us to get our rook active, and all of a sudden the a6 pawn becomes a target as a result. So hooks are usually a weakness, and it's always good to be um, paying attention to those and seeing if you can exploit them. Okay, so we've got two more examples here. All right, so this is one I took uh, from one of the, uh, I think it was an ECF Academy courses or something, yeah. those pos training positions. So some of you might have seen this before, but if you haven't, you can give it a go. So it's black to move. You have to find the right idea here. So try to look at for a pawn lever and try work out what's the best move here for black. Now remember that your lever straight away might not work. So you might need a 
prophylactic move first to make it work better. So this one, whoops, I do not want my files. Let's put my timer back on. <laughs> All right, must be a tricky question. No one's answered so far. I have had a couple of answers. Yeah, do try and write them privately, please. That's great. I don't stand. Okay, so a lever or a hook is something where two pawns are kind of fighting each other. So there's a way to uh, try and open up the position, basically. So, for example, b4 could be classed as a lever because if he if he takes, you can try to open up the position. Right? It's not really a very good one because white can just go straight past you. So what you kind of want you want something where you can um, open the position and like and force them to to open up the position, basically. So you shouldn't be trying to sack pieces of, I don't know, bishop takes g5. We can't just give away that bishop, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I remember the whole topic today is about pawn play, right? Not not bishops. Bishops, uh, you know, we'll save them for another time, maybe. Okay, so we've got a lot of suggestions. We've got like h6, we've got g6, we've got f6, we've got c3, we've got b4. I think you guys just wanted to suggest every pawn move available just to <laughs> make things difficult for me, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Um. All right, so yeah, definitely we should we shouldn't be sacrificing any material. So if we go like c3, then I can just gobble that one. Doesn't seem uh, like we'd really achieved a whole lot. B4 is not necessarily a bad idea, but maybe they can just go a4 and kind of keep that position kind of uh, closed. So it doesn't really again do too much. A5 mm, again doesn't really feel like we're playing kind of on the right side of the board here. Um, so the first thing I think we should note is that although it's nice to play for the king. Um, we don't really have that much material left. We only have a knight, bishop, and a rook. So to try and attack this king and get some sort of checkmate going is a little bit unlikely. So I think trying to open the position on this side is maybe a bit premature. Instead, we should be kind of focusing on these pawns because these are the ones that are like in our half of the board. And so they could be uh, become a weakness. They're a little bit overextended, meaning it's easier for us to attack them and not so easy for them to, to defend. So these are the sort of moves we should be looking at, h6, g6, or f6. Now f6, I think we can disregard quite quickly because black, uh, sorry, white has too many pieces that can, can get us on that square. G6 looks good, but then maybe they go h6 and keep the position closed, which again kind of defeats the whole point of the, of the hook. So h6 is kind of the one we want to play. But the problem is if he just takes, we don't really have a great way to recapture. Because if we take with a G pawn, well, now we have just as many pawn lines as them. We've got one over here, second one here, third one over there. So that is a little bit annoying. And if we take with the knight, well, the knight's now not, um, you know, it's had to kind of go away from its good square and it gives maybe black, uh, white some time to, to, to penetrate into our half of the board, which we also don't really want. So that's why I said that we might need a, yeah, a pre uh, preparatory move instead. And that's why we go first rook to h8. So pretty hard move to spot. Um, but this gives you a little bit of an insight to how stronger players are finding moves like this. Because what I should tell you is that if I gave this position to a strong player, that's like a grandmaster, I don't think they would see rook h8 straight away. And so the way they would find this move is they would look at the most kind of natural move, like a, like a pawn break, a pawn lever. And they would realize what is wrong with that move, that if we go h6 straight away, they can just take, we would have a good way to recapture. And then the grandmaster might think, ah, okay, Let's go and go back and see if I can make that um, that line a little bit uh, a little bit better. And so we first plays rook move, which looks a bit strange. And uh, now they go h6. And the difference is if white takes, rook will just take, and that pawn on h5 is a goner. Right. So the rook gets active. If he doesn't take, he goes he goes g6 instead. We can take take and go h5, and now we get an outside pass pawn which we've seen is already very dangerous, and the rook can come over here and just win material as well. Okay, so this is a good example of um, a break uh, in the white position, and that way uh, the black pieces are able to get active as a result. I think it's, um, it's quite a lot of people said to me rook d8, and whilst that's probably the most obvious move, like to sure. control the file, the problem with rook d8 is it doesn't really achieve anything because uh, white, white does have domination of the d file, but white doesn't have a way of breaking through on the d file, so you need to find your own way through. 
And that's why um, Brandon's Rook HJ is a fantastic move there. Yeah, exactly. So for those of you that were in the previous session, we talked a lot about these kind of open files. And I mentioned there that the whole point of having the open file is to be able to penetrate into their half of the board, especially as seventh and eighth ranks. And so if white doesn't have that ability to, to penetrate, then it's not really so relevant that his rook has his open file. And so we can kind of just let him sit there, right? And so that's why we, don't, we're not, we shouldn't really be in a rush just to trade, trade the, these guys. Okay, fantastic. So let's go to the next one then. So again, we're looking for kind of uh, where the hook is and we want to see if a way where we can uh, utilize that. So white to play, what do you think white should do here? How much time is he gonna give us? I'll give you the whole minute. Great no, I don't think it's that difficult. Yeah, already had the correct answer through from Katie. But at least if everyone gets this right, then it feels like we can move on to the next uh, the next topic. Is everyone's understanding the hook. Okay. Is a hook for fishing? Yeah, I mean it can be. Mm -hmm. Depends. Depends on yeah. Depends on if you like fishing or not. I never really like fishing much, but Good fishing. Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe if you like Captain Hook and the Peter Pan dude, <laughs> maybe maybe that as well. Who knows? Yeah, it is right to play. By the way. Um... Yeah, looks like everyone's got the right answer though. So that's good to see. Okay, perfect. So yeah, the, the correct move here is to go pawn to a4. This is kind of the, the hook. This is one we want to latch onto. And so we need to go a4 before we give black a chance to go a5 and do the same, you know, to us. So again, very important to be aware of black's ideas. We play a4 first and now threatening to take and uh, the rook would be in a pin. Now, let's say black just goes king to d7. One interesting thing to note here is again, if you have kind of a strategic advantage, you shouldn't be in a rush to, uh, you know, to be kind of dynamic, right? So I think taking it straight away would be a mistake because then you you release the tension and uh, you didn't really achieve too much because like there's no, you're not winning material, they can just take back and you know, if you take the rook, then the other rook will come over and take. And so when you have a situation like this and you have this kind of hook, um, you're the one that has like the, the like the trigger here you can release uh you can take on on your terms whenever you're ready i think first you should just improve your position like this like double the rooks put the rook on a1 and only then should you be looking to maybe to take because in that way if they take it you can then try to get in for example let's say they try to do the same thing rook to a7 rook to a1 rook to a8 right now because you you're ready you can take they take and all of a sudden they end up losing a rook which is uh not really Design. Yeah, don't rush because a lot of children they just get excited and rush. But um, stronger players will take their time and prepare it first, and that's yeah. what I just showed there, doubling on the A file. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Okay, fantastic. So let's go to the next one then. So we've got this uh, concept, the isolated pawn. So again, it's another position that is um, maybe seen been seen before, um, but as, as again, it's a really nice one I think for demonstrating this this point where. Black has the bishop pair advantage, uh, but the problem is that bishops aren't really very, very active and the black structure isn't, isn't very good either. And so I kind of highlighted here that if black could play pawn to b6, it would probably be the best move in the, in the position. But of course, I think if you did that move, your opponent might uh, be a bit confused and he might tell the arbiter. Um, you'd hope anyway. I mean, if they didn't notice and maybe that's good, but... Um, then you'd have, to, you'd have to move the pawn. If you, had, if you had to go c5, then you just lose a pawn for, uh, for nothing. So that's not very good either. So whenever you have a situation where you have a weak pawn, like a backward pawn or an isolated pawn, a double pawn, any of these sorts of things, if you can find a way to trade them off for a healthy pawn, then that would be really good for your position. So definitely we want to go c5, but we shouldn't do it and just sacrifice material um, necessarily, right? Um, so you need to first find a way to prepare this move. So black to move, what do you think we should do to uh, help us go get C, the C5 break?
<laughs> Rook C7. Are you sure? Are you sure, guys? Once white lodges that rook on C5, then we're in if you go if you go rook C7, oh, really? Thanks, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna gobble. <laughs> Uh, it is a positional lesson, but also we're going to take pieces if they're available. Oh, no. I like free pawns. Yeah, I like free, pieces. free rooks. <laughs> Happy with that. All right, um, Fred. Someone wants to move Freddy. I mean, it's tempting. I, I've always wanted to move Freddy, but you know, he's usually not so good. So I, I try to uh, hold myself back. I've only had one correct answer. Um, Kush. I, I, actually got, I actually got quite a few. I, thought okay, the really? most, I think they did, yeah, quite early on, though. Oh, yeah, and Coral as well. And that's pretty yeah. Cool. Oh, it's because they're doing direct message rights. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah. To me. It's fine. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so we've got yeah, a lot of things. So basically, the main ones were like f5, e5, whoops. And we had some bishop f8 kind of preparing this, this c5. So let's look at these ones first then. Um, now, again, it's very important with when you're paying attention to the pawns to be very careful about which pawns you move because. Uh, remember that every pawn move creates a, a weakness, right? They're a permanent weakness because pawns can never move backwards. So they, they're very delicate things and you've got to be very careful not to, uh, to spoil, to spoil them, right? Like imagine going to the, you know, the shops with your parents, you do the grocery shopping, it's very boring and you have to, uh, you know, go pick up the eggs and stuff and you go all that way, you come all the way back home, but then you've cracked the eggs on the way home and you've got to go all the way back out and do it all over again. Disaster, right? You can't go back and just like you know put the fix the eggs. You can't glue them back together. You got to go. You got to start all over again. So here, for example, if you go f5, uh, the problem is these two minor pieces have now really benefited from you moving this pawn because they can go straight into this e5 square. So you've created a big hole, and this guy's become a backward pawn as well, which then white can maybe try to target like this. So f5, I don't like so much because yeah, you give away this big square on e5, um, so that's probably not ideal. E5 is, um, yeah, it's an interesting idea, but again, you're not really helping to trade this pawn off. We actually want to trade this guy for this guy. And so if we go E5, he can just take, and then this pawn's always going to be, you know, yes, he can move forward, but like, he's always going to be, he's going to be there, right? So he's still going to be isolated. And he's not that, not that useful. We don't want to do that either. So the correct move is just to go bishop back to F8, and that way we can try to play for C5. Um, ideally, White wants to just try to stop us doing this, but the problem is if he goes like Rook C1, we can just take that pawn on A2. And so he can't really afford to do it straight away. So instead, he's going to go a3. And now that gives us a chance before he gets b4. We now have to break. If he gets b4 in, we're going to be squashed. So we need to get out like this, c5. He takes, we take, he takes, we take, he takes, we take. We take. And all of a sudden, you can see that both our bishops have now become very nice and active. And we have kind of no uh, real weaknesses, right? We've got two pawn islands, which is the same as white. Uh, okay, we have this one ice pawn over here, but that's not such a big deal. And our structure has been improved um, a lot to the point where I think black is actually quite a lot better here. Yeah, that bishop was such a bad piece on b7 when the pawn was on c6, but now that bishop's come right into yeah. the frame. So that's a fantastic move. Well done if you got it. If you didn't get it, then just try and understand why that's a good move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so always look for ways where you can exchange your bad pawns for their, for their good pawns. Okay, this one is all about, again, we have this kind of isolated um, pawn on d4, but we're going to try and use that somehow and try and ruin um, black structure because at the moment black has like two pawn islands, one over here, second one over there. We have currently three pawn islands. And so we want to, uh, you know, try and ruin our opponent's structure if we can. So white to play, how do you think we can go about doing that? I'll give you about 30 seconds because you guys are good. <laughs> Don't need a whole minute. Yeah, they're doing really well. I'm very impressed. Keep it up. Because this is known for being a bit more boring than nice attacking positions, but it's essential if you want to get better at chess, which I'm sure you all do. Yep. Because first you have to have a positional advantage, you have to have a superior position before the tactics will um, occur. You can't just go gun ho from the start of the game. Okay, so we've got basically two main ideas then. We've got knight to e5 and d5, so they're good suggestions. 
Um, so let's start with 95. The problem with this move, I guess, is black would just take, you take, he takes, you take, and it goes like maybe 94. And we didn't really help to ruin their, their structure a great deal. Um, we kind of also put our pawn on the same color as our bishop, which makes it a little bit less uh, mobile. So I'm not really that fond of this idea. Instead, I think it would be better to go d5, winning a tempo on the knight. And the point is after knight two goes to e7, we can now trade these guys off the board. And now we can the uh, the king as a result. So we've given really destroyed black's uh, pawn structure, which is great for us. Okay. Um, so next one, I want to, to kind of illustrate this. So mostly these double uh, isolated double pawns are a very bad thing, right? A massive weakness. But now I wanted to kind of touch on that not all double pawns are bad, right? As long as they've got like someone nearby and they're not isolated, then they can often be um, be quite good. So this is the position I take. I took from one of my um, files on the, against the London system. And here, black has played kind of queen to b6, attacking the pawn, and white responded with queen to b3. Uh, so these guys are having like a little kung fu staring contest at each other, and we wonder who's going to who's going to who's going to win. And black goes c4, which is yeah what KT suggested. So good job suggesting that one. Um, it looks a bit of a strange move because we're kind of provoking uh, white just to take our, our queen. But there's this kind of famous principle, which is a good one to remember, that the side that captures last gets the more active piece or position. So if we were to capture first, white gets to capture last, and as a result, he gets a very active uh, rook. Right? And these double pawns actually aren't that you know, problematic because he has a pawn um, like this. Okay. If we could take and force him to take back with a c-pawn, these guys become isolated and doubled. And then it's not so not so good for white, yeah? But because we can't force that after we take, they can just take with the e-pawn instead. Then they have this nice little kind of island. And that way, it's not a problem at all. Um, so that's, yeah, not a real big issue for, for, uh, for white. So instead, we go c4. And the problem for, for, for white now is if he takes, we, we get to capture last. And so we're the ones that get the, the active rook as a result. And now let's say to go like knight to d2. We could even look for a way to get rid of our double pawns, right? B5. So remember, we can exchange our, our weak pawns. That would be great. A3. And the problem here for white is he's not in time, right? His rook is kind of in the pin. If you could go rook c1, then maybe white would be absolutely fine here. But because he doesn't have the time, we can go b4, take, knight takes. And now we've undoubled our pawns. Um, black is doing really well and should have some sort of advantage. Okay, so they basically can't take on b6. So we kind of won that staring contest and he has to then retreat the queen instead. Queen goes back to c2. And now we can still be tricky. So again, remember, you have superior position, then the tactics will come uh, naturally. So now we can go bishop to f5. Boom, nice little deflection idea. If the queen takes, we'll have that. Thank you very much. That rock is very juicy. And if they go, well, back to c1 instead, then we are... Um, getting all our pieces out very quickly and the queen looks a little bit silly, right? She's gone to b3, back to c2, now to c1, wasting a lot of time and our pieces are getting nice and active. So next thing I wanted to show you in this position is these two moves, h3 and h6. These are kind of a useful prophylactic type move where you've got to anticipate that your opponent might want to go like knight h4, oops, like this, and try and exchange his knight for your bishop, which you don't want to allow. And so playing these moves like h6 is a really nice way to um, just provide a nice escape square for your, your bishop. So it's a useful one to include here. White's going to do the same. We continue developing normally. And now white plays this move pawn to b3. So now this is kind of the critical moment of this variation. So white is attacking our pawn on c4. It's kind of like the hook. And the issue that we have is we just take, we allow white to capture last and capture towards the center. And he gets everything. He can now play c4, he can play, he's got the active rook. Looks like a bit of a disaster. So our opening doesn't look like it's that great anymore. So this is, a, this is why this is a critical moment. If we could play pawn to b5, that would be fantastic. We can keep uh, you know, our pawn chain. But of course, that's not possible. So black to move, who can find the critical move here to ensure that we don't end up in a worse position? So I'll give you your whole minute. Because maybe this is a tricky question. I've been I've been nice once. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
lag to move, what should we do about this b3 situation? Queen to b6. Well, our queen is already on b6. I think there's a queen b5, but that looks very good. Ah, I see. Just walking into a pin with queen b5, and white can probably just take on c4. Yeah, remember if you're trying to reinforce something, you've got to make sure you count like whether you have enough um, defenders or not. Because a lot of people like you're suggesting it's knight a5, but I mean you only have two defenders and white has one, two, three attackers. So it doesn't really help, which is why you need the pawn, right? The pawn is the best defender you can possibly have. Because it is low value. Someone can't hear me. Why is that? Although to be fair, I wasn't really, I wasn't talking before, so maybe that's why. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can definitely hear you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I was gonna hear me, so should be fine. Uh, maybe it's like on, on their end. Try and walk into a pin with the queen, not queen b5 or queen a6. And as Brandon said, if you can count, which you all can, because you're all very clever and good at chess, that pawn's attacked three times by the pawn, the knight and the bishop. So just defending by the queen doesn't even help. White can take it anyway. So we need to think of a more clever move here. Yeah, and actually we need to be we need to be aggressive because if you play something like queen to eight, this might look like a good idea to go for b5, um, but it's way too slow, way too slow. They can just take and you didn't get b5, right? So you can't, they can't do that. Um, Bishop d3 was an interesting suggestion some of you guys su uh, yeah, suggested, but uh, hmm. maybe I can just take, right? I, I thought the same. Maybe I can just take. And it takes maybe knight takes c4 is a clever way of still um yeah taking i can still defending my knight so i think that would be fine so actually yeah the best move and i don't think really anyone got this i mean someone maybe got the right idea but they maybe put the wrong coordinates they said h5 so i guess they assume like this a5 one but yeah if, you, if that's what you meant that's yeah fantastic so queen to a5 is the best move because not only do we help to go for the b5 but we're trying to be dynamic as well so now if white tries to take we can punish him by going bishop into a3. Queen only has one safe square. And now queen goes into c, c3. And all of a sudden, it's white who's in a lot of trouble because black is better developed. Um, we can afford to start going on the attack. So instead, let's say white realizes now that you know his, his last move was maybe a mistake and decides to go b4 instead. Well, now we can actually decide just to take this guy off. OK, we get two pawns for the piece, but we've also got a very strong attack. Threats like knight c2 are coming. And again, White's position is looking pretty bad. Okay, so that was yeah, a very important moment. Um, so again, an important part of becoming a strong chess player is to kind of uh, identify when these critical moments are happening in your games. Because as soon as you think there's a critical moment where it could change the overall evaluation of the position, you need to spend a little bit more time, not be in a rush, and try to find the right solution. Because if you make the wrong choice, you do queen d8 or you play knight a5, something like this, then all of a sudden, um, you know, white might be better, and then it's hard to kind of against a good player. You might not get a you know a second chance. They're gonna just uh, they're gonna punish you. So. Yeah, this is a complicated game, and there are often solutions. Usually, solutions if you dedicate enough time and focus to it, which is why mm -hmm. I'm saying slow down, think about your moves. And here, it's the c4 pawn that's attacked, but you actually get around this by going queen a5 and attacking the c3 pawn in white's position. So don't necessarily think oh, I've got to defend the c4 because it's attacked. Think about attacking. Yeah targets in your opponent's position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all very good advice there. Um, okay, so let's carry on. With some more double pawns. Uh, actually, let's let's skip these ones because we've done, I think, enough on double pawns. You can you can always, you know, all this stuff you're going to get sent is all in interactive format. So you can have a go with the uh, octopus guy and uh, test yourselves if you can find the right the right moves. So we can skip over those ones. And go on to try to get through some of these, these last few things. So minority attack, this is when we try to use our, our minority. So here we can see that black has three pawns on the queen side. We only have the, the two, so hence the minority. And we want to try and use that somehow to uh, weaken the black pawn structure. So if we go first knight e5, the problem is this pawn is, uh, is guarded by another pawn, right? So it's like hitting this brick wall. So first we need to do b4, which is yeah what William suggested, fantastic and try to first soften up the, the c6 pawn. 
let's say something like this happens. And let's just say, for, for example, I go king h8, we'd go b5, take, 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 take. And now the situation is much different because now we can go like knight e5 and this pawn is uh, become a big weakness, right? So that would be perfect. Okay, so let's get that. Uh, pawn breakthrough, another very important aspect of um, yeah, pawn play. So a lot of you guys would have seen this as a very famous example. So it's good to note that also uh, same number of pawns can actually have the opportunity to break through. And remember that in the end game, one of the main objectives is to create the, a, a pass pawn. And so here, why I can do that by going b6, now the black takes, go c6, black has to take, and now a6, we finally managed to find, we found a way to break through. We're going to queen first and therefore white will win. A more complicated example of that idea would be in this example. We've got four on four. And what I want to mention about this is that um, as a general rule, you should break through the pawn, which does not allow them to fix their structure. Okay. So if you play, for example, h5, this would be the wrong way because they can take. And after f5, you've got to assume that they're not going to just take you. We've got to assume they're going to make the best moves. And because you've now helped their structure, you undoubled their pawns, they can just go g6. And now you have simply no way to, to break through anymore. So the correct move would be to go uh, f5. Yep, so good job. Those that just kind of saw that. Uh, f5, and even though it looks like we're allowing them to undouble their pawns, technically they're not. They, when they take like this, they just make a new set of double pawns instead. And so and so they take like this, you can go h5, they take g6, they take in that e6, and our pawn again will promote. So always be on the lookout for these types of pawn breakthrough ideas. Okay, hobbled majority. So here we can see that white has a majority on the king side, a four against a three. Black has a majority on the queen side, a four against a three. Um, but the black majority has been kind of restricted because of the double pawns. And this is actually a big problem in the end game because uh, um, the problem with having a hobbled majority is that they have this kind of inability to create a, a pass pawn. And so I provided kind of a extension of this example um, here. So this is kind of where the pawns had moved forward. And the issue is, okay, black is trying to do some breakthrough ideas with pawn to a3. And so white's next move is very, very important. So I'll give you a little bit of time to solve that. Maybe like just 30 seconds, because we're kind of running out of time here. So you guys can, uh, white to move basically. White to move, what should white play? Yeah, so um, Isla said she didn't understand what you meant, I think. And um, here, Brandon's just saying that a uh, black threat is to play a3, and we're not going to be able to stop the black from getting the queen. So we need to be yeah. prophylactic, look at what our opponent's trying to do and stop it. Yeah, exactly. So again, always pay attention to your opponent's ideas as well. It'll make it much easier for you to find the right move. Okay, yeah, so black is threatening to go a3, and if, he, if we allow him to do that, he can maybe break through and make use of his majority. So it's very important we first play the move a3 ourselves, and that way we completely fix that structure. So for example, after they go pawn to b3, now their extra pawn on this side of the board is completely um, useless. And now white can win this just by zugzwang. Okay, black has to make a move. He has to even move his king back or take the pawn. And then just to kind of show you how white would win this, he slowly kind of advances on this side of the board. He uses his majority to create an outside pass pawn. And then after the king goes to the corner, he will just run his king to, over to the other side and collect all of those helpless pawns. So white will now, now go on to win. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're running out of time. So these last few things we can just leave uh, again as puzzles. So this will be sent to you. You can have a look through. I even included two of my um, own games as well. So you can see, you know, try and put yourself in my shoes, see if you can uh, find the right way um, to play in those situations. Great. Well, thank you very Great. much, Brandon. That was excellent. And yeah, we did have to rush through a bit at the end now, but all the materials available will be emailed to you after the class. And I really yep. advise you to spend some time going through the positions and trying to get them right. So if you can improve your end games, then you'll get a lot better at chess. And um, so yeah, thank you very much, Brandon.